My name is Charles Kleibecker. I'm a couture designer from New York City, and I've been here on the beautiful inspirational campus of Iowa State University, working with its very fine home and economics department, conducting a week seminar in couture design and construction. I thought you might like to know how a designer does start. We first buy sample lengths of fabric, which might be somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to 10 yards. And in my particular case, when I have that sample length, I take it in my hands first on the straight grain to feel the richness of the folds on that grain. And then I take it in my hands on the cross grain to see what happens with the folds on that grain. Because in my workroom in New York City, we are very often placing the pattern on the cross grain when it comes to wovens, because many wovens are meant to be worked on the cross grain. I'm always taking it also on the bias. Not really a grain, but could we refer to it that way at the moment? And it is that beautiful, fluid stretch of bias which I feel is the most beautiful grain for the female anatomy, where that anatomy goes out and indents in and then out again. That fluid, limpid stretch of bias really follows that curve and that anatomy. After I have done that experimenting with the fabric, and when I talk about taking the cross grain on wovens, what we do in my workroom is to grain off a small piece, and we see whether it is the cross grain or the salvage straight grain that first stitches better at the machine and whichever works better at the iron. Whichever grain works better on wovens, that is how we determine whether to cut on the straight grain or the cross grain, and of course, most of the clothes you see today will be hitting the bias. After I played around with the fabric, I let the ideas gyrate in my head and work on a form and put the fabric against the girl's body, and then my idea develops into muslin. And so I'd like to bring on Cindy in the kind of a muslin I do first to develop an idea. Yes, I do a complete muslin, and that's where we work out the initial fit because I feel the only way to get beautiful designer couture clothes is to concentrate on fit. That short word, as I see it, is the crux of it all. So I work out first my fitting in muslin, and I do my pinning, my fitting on one half of that muslin, and then that half I take apart, and that becomes my permanent pattern. You see here Cindy without a sleeve. When I fit a sleeve, I don't have it in the garment initially or the muslin initially, and then I really work from the outside. We're going to go into this a little bit later on how I set in a set-in sleeve from the right side. Incidentally, this is a bias sleeve, and could I give you a thought? If you're getting out of a garment with a bias dress and those are skinny sleeves, turn that sleeve inside out. It will slip off very easily. I'm going to pivot Cindy to show the back of it. We are bias front and back, the sleeve all bias, which means that if you bend that elbow, that bias grain is going to give with you and be comfortable. Where I had a great deal of the fitting problem was in this yoke. And that is where my money goes very often in all of this careful fitting. And you might be able to see this little bit of a pie shape in the back over the shoulder, which had started out as two darts, which looked very tacky to me, so we worked those two darts into what I like to think of as a design line. The anatomy on the anatomy was telling me what wanted to happen here. It is my not dictating, it is not my dictating rather, to the anatomy, it is the anatomy telling me what it wants. The first version of that dress, we're bringing Judy on in it, please. If I may have you here, Cindy. The first version of that dress is here on Judy, or rather at the moment we're showing it to you as a skirt and a blouse. It is a day and age when it seems to me in fashion that many women think in terms of a blouse and a skirt, a blouse, a trouser, say, for more of their daytime wear. I find it costs me as much practically to make a blouse as it does a dress. And it seems to me that every time I make one of those blouses, I hear from the woman the next day that she couldn't get it tucked in. With that thinking, I've been doing, finding first, very, very skinny fabrics, and I've decided 
that that blouse could actually be a dress and I would not have the problem of hearing from the woman the next day of how do I keep it tucked in. And in that way, in that I feel the economics and the aesthetics must be combined in the couture world, I can sell a dress and make more money than if I was doing a blouse. So here is really the first version from the muslin. This is in what I think is a very beautiful and interesting piece of jersey. It is a combination of silk and fibron the very uh, lush rayon fiber. Here we are that same bias sleeve. Instead of the four inch belt, which I know cannot always be that comfortable, we've done a skinny little bias tie, which became a bit of a theme in the collection I did this time. But here it is that same pie shape that did the fit. Here again, we are all bias grain. I never put a zipper in in bias so that with all of this shirring or gathering, we really didn't have to put a zipper. There's enough fabric there to cover. I did have what I thought was a rather interesting detail. When we were first fitting this garment, I had one large button to one button hole, and the buttons and the buttonholes were slopping all over the place. And I realized I would have to put unending hooks and eyes or snaps, so I came into the thinking that maybe two small buttons to one buttonhole would hold it right there, and as it happened, it did do just that. I have a great time when women come in and say, isn't that a marvelous detail? And I say, well, yes, but I know that it all developed out of necessity. So here we are. This dress takes about seven and a half yards of fabric in the short version. The next version on Diane is in what I'm hoping many of you will consider because beautiful pure silk taffeta, marvelously romantic and rustly, is back in the fashion picture. And here again, how I developed from that muslin because the more I can use this muslin, which I spent so much money in fitting on, the more I can develop it into different dresses in my collection, the more identity I get for that collection and secondly, speaking economically, the more money I save. And it is very interesting, I feel, that each and every time the girl in one of my workrooms makes this dress, it becomes just that much better. So, having initially invested in this yoke with great many fittings and in the body of the dress, I now like to work around that. So here we are with that same yoke on Diane in pure silk taffeta. What you see we have done here is to simply cut to make a peplum, which we've hand rolled, and added a very wide bias sash. And I will start now in saying to you that when you are stitching long bias seams, preserve that grain until you are at the machine, but once there, having hand basted, stretch like mad just what I'm doing as you are stitching at the machine. We've done this skirt as the one you saw on Judy, so that if you would like to wear this with, say, a simple short waist for a less formal occasion, it would give you more wear. As you're seeing on these girls with their great waistlines, if you have a little bit of more flesh there, all of this bias tucking does give with you. Robin, may I have you to show another version of this yoke idea from me? A superb piece of silk chiffon, satin striped, made by Bucol in France. I worked long at deciding what grain I was going to cut this on. I finally arrived because I felt the lights in the satin were so much better on the cross grain, and I thought that might make an interesting slim skirt, which fashion seems to be getting back into the picture a bit also. So here we are on the cross grain in the front. On the side, we drift into bias, excuse me, Robin, and on the back, we're on complete straight grain. We've hand rolled this entire cape, and we tried our best to make it look as though it were over flesh, so we lined the yoke part. We underlined first in silk shantung, and then we faced it, and the, rather the top underlining was in silk crepe de chine. I have another layer of silk shantung, and then we have faced in the silk crepe de chine again. The skirt, a very simple shape, straight grain on the cross. 
underlined first in the silk crepe de chine and then in another layer of silk, uh, now what is it, silk shantung. Now, here we had the idea that we wanted a very bare look. And I went through this business again of would we do a separate mayo or a halter, so to speak. And there again, that story of how do you keep it really weighted on the body. So I decided that what we would do would just be another underdress that you could have on its own for a different time of day. This is a very, very lightweight piece of silk crepe de chine. So much so that one layer of it was not good. So what we did, was to underline in exactly the same fabric. Now, yes, I must get a certain amount of money for my clothes, and I feel I should give the person who comes to me as a private client everything. So rather than trying to find an underlining that maybe would not have cost quite as much, I simply took the same fabric and underlined. It is a very, very fine, supple piece of silk crepe de chine. This dress has been held in the way most of my dresses are in the back here. So it stays right up against Robin's body. We'll go more and more into that. It is a day and age of what is called unconstructed fashion. I'm all for, for that kind of a garment. But I find that one must hold in the fabric that it has been held in here also to keep that dress supported. I think the person who does this in the most magnificent way is Madame Grez in Paris. I've had conversations with her, and we have an interesting, uh, interesting time agreeing upon how one holds in the fabrics all the way around. Could I bring on Dr. Agatha Eupenbecker, who is the head of this great department at Iowa State University? And on Agatha, we have that same idea of the yoke. This time I turned it around, but that pie shape is there. We did it with a very wide piece of fabric to make the cape because there is no seam in this cape but for the yoke. In other words, in the back, I'm on the cross grain, and in the front, I'm on the straight grain, and then again on the sides, we hit all these biases. This is a jersey out of the Kiana fiber, but the people who made it had silk in mind and they took the Kiana fiber and did it as though it were the silk fiber. Here again, that story that we did two buttons to one button hole. And in the yoke, I have four layers. The outer layer of jersey, which incidentally we stretched to get all of the stretch out of it, pinned it all around on a table so we could make it act as a woven, then underlined it with two layers of silk shantung and then faced it with the heavy four-ply silk crepe. And underneath, the same silhouette from that yoke with that very biasy sleeve so you could bend your elbow and be comfortable. This time, we did not do the tucks as you see here and as I should have shown you on the muslin where we really stitched tucks to hold the bias in. Here, we left them out, did a tiny little opening in the side seam, and I think that that way you get a rather marvelous flow to this different combination in a crepe de chine. This is 50% silk, 50% Kiana. Because we have 13 yards in this fabric, I left a rather high opening in the side so that you might go up a step or you might dance with ease. So here we are as how one gets an idea, does it first in muslin, then to give your collection a continuity, a theme, and also to help you in the way of economics, because this must be thought of in this fashion world and this fashion design, the many different diversions that derived from this first idea.